An invariant is a quantity which would be judged to have the same value as observed by any observer in any reference frame. We've already seen that the speed of light, c, is an invariant in all frames. Actually, this was considered to be a postulate, but as we've seen in special relativity, all observers report c to have the same value no matter what frame of reference they stand in. We've also seen that space-time coordinates like position x and time t are not invariant. Under the Lorentz transformations, x and t become new quantities, x prime and t prime, in some new frame, s prime, and in general, these, these coordinates do not have the same value. So therefore, since not all observers agree on their value, these are not considered invariants. We're looking then for a quantity that's associated with a space-time event, of both a position and a time, that will be an invariant. To do so, we're going to consider a particular case of a light flash that occurs at the origin, which is to say at a value of x and of c times t equal to zero. And we'll say that this occurs in frame s, and the light propagates outward in all directions at speed c. So it makes a ball. We can now ask what is an observer in frame s prime c if s prime is a frame of reference moving at speed v relative to s. First we should point out that the, the ball of light emanates outward at speed c in all different directions, so it has an eventual radius that depends on the time of propagation, r is equal to ct, or as will be convenient to come to discuss later, r squared is equal to c squared times t squared. R is the, the radius of the light's propagation, so it's, it's equal to the sum of squares of x squared plus y squared plus c squared, z squared. This is our starting point for discussion, and now we can examine what happens in the frame S prime. Let's go back to our lens transformations. We know something about what the coordinates are in the prime frame. We know that x is equal to gamma times x prime plus beta ct prime. And we know that ct is equal to gamma ct prime plus beta x prime. And we know that the y and the z coordinates are unchanged if the relative velocity between s and s prime, the two frames, is along the x direction. We can substitute these expressions into our starting point, r squared equals c squared t squared. And in this case, we'll have the following expression. We'll have in square brackets the quantity x, quantity squared, but now we've written it in terms of prime coordinates. And in the second case, we have the quantity y squared, but since y is equal to y prime, we just substituted y prime here. In the third case, we have z squared, but since z is equal to z prime, in the third term, we just put z prime squared. All of this has to equal ct squared, and now we've put in what is the value for ct is written in its prime coordinates. Let's expand out the two brackets, the two square brackets in their squares. In this case, we have three terms. The first term squared, the second term, the second term squared, and twice the cross term. Likewise, over here, we have, when we square the second bracket, we have the first term squared, the second term squared, and twice the cross term. Notice that the terms through which I put a red slash cancel out on both sides of the equation. Notice also that there are two terms, one on either side of the equation, that depend on ct prime. We'll gather those together in just a moment. Also notice that there are two terms, one on either side of the equation, that I've underlined in green, that depend on the variable x prime. We'll collect those on one side of the equation as well. What we find is that gamma squared times 1 minus beta squared times x prime squared is all collected on one, in one term, plus y prime squared plus c prime squared is equal to the same factor of gamma squared 1 minus beta squared all times c t prime squared. But notice that gamma squared times 1 minus beta squared is equal to 1. That's because gamma is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared. As a result, these two coefficients here and here can just be set to 1, 
and we have that x prime squared plus y prime squared plus z prime squared equals ct prime squared. In other words, the observer in S prime also thinks that the light has reached a sp spherical shell after propagating for time t prime, as measured in his own frame S prime. What he doesn't realize is that his coordinates have been stretched or squished relative to frame S, but he doesn't care. For him, the light propagates outward in, a, in the form of a ball, just as it would be expected to, because the propagation of light should be unchanged for all frames. So the key finding here is that there is an invariant quantity in relativity. Although the coordinates x, y, z, and t become a new set of coordinates x prime, y prime, z prime, and t prime in the new frame s prime, and these are not equal, there is a quantity that's equal. If we define little s squared as to, to be the square of ct minus the square of r, then this quantity will be an invariant. It will be unchanged no matter what frame we calculate it in, or all observers in all frames will calculate the same value for this quantity. The particular example we've seen of a light flash starting from the origin and propagating out to some uh, surface of a ball calculates the value of s between two space-time points, one at the origin and the other at the surface of the ball. For this pair of space-time points, the relative value of s squared is equal to zero, and we saw that it was equal to zero no matter what frame we were in. But we will soon consider other pairs of space-time points, which have a separation s squared, which can be positive or negative. In any case, s squared will be an invariant. In other words, as we change frames, we will have the same value for that particular pair of space-time points that we're considering. 